Good morning, or whenever. I suppose it used to be the morning. Um, this is the first time recording anything, so we'll see how it goes. So this first lecture is on wetlands. Um, we are going to be covering in this recording just what makes a wetland, so thinking about groundwater, what a water table is, and what that has to do with what a wetland is. Big concepts wise, um, we want to think about that wetlands come in many forms. They're going to have three big things in common, so you need to know these three things. What makes something a wetland? In the next few lectures, I don't remember how it breaks out, um, you'll look at the ecosystem services wetlands provide and then um, how we've sort of changed the trends in how we view wetlands. So this first one, groundwater in the water table, if you think about when you're walking around outside in your house right now, somewhere beneath your feet, the ground is totally saturated with water, unless you live on a giant rock. Um, so that water where it's totally saturated is called groundwater. And then there's some area of soil, usually, unless you live in a wetland, where in between where the groundwater is and where the soil surface is, that there's this transitional area where the soil still has air pockets where the plant roots are going to move through and be looking for nutrients, but they're not going to be flooded because if you think about plant roots, those still need to breathe. So that area in between is not saturated. There's still air pockets in there in places without totally saturated water. water. So the top of the groundwater is called the water table. So thinking about groundwater in the water table, here you're looking at this sort of um, cut through of a landscape and you have the water table where below that is all saturated any pore is going to be filled with water above that is your unsaturated zone and that's where your plant roots are going to be mostly located and then as you get toward this sort of sloping landscape and it goes downward it dips below the water table and so then we get standing water on the surface and that's important because that is going to determine where wetlands form so an area that is a wetland is going to have standing water, somewhere where the water table is at or above the surface, at least seasonally, but it doesn't have to be there all year. So that level of the water table is going to rise in the wet season and drop in the dry season. And we have seen a little bit about how groundwater can change. when We looked at freshwater withdrawals, especially in the Central Valley, and we saw the Central Valley, the surface of the land collapse because so much groundwater had been removed. And that is a physical part of our Earth's crust is all this water. So if you take it away, you're physically removing part of the Earth's crust and then it drops. So in this picture, you can see that a wet meadow has sort of formed here, an area that would probably be totally dry in the dry season and be fine to walk across. But then once it starts to rain and that water table rises and comes up above the ground surface, these little low points are going to be spots where water collects. So this is a seasonal wetland. This is somewhere where you might see frog eggs or salamander eggs, um, really important habitats for amphibians who tend to be breeding in that wet season and need a wet spot to lay their eggs. So what makes a wetland? It's saturated or covered by water for at least part of the year. So the water table is at or above the surface of the ground for at least part of the year. So wetlands can be seasonal. They don't have to be wet year round. So we can look at this kind of cross section again of a landscape and you can look at low water. So that's the level of the water table in the dry season and then high water. That would be the level of the water in the wet season. So anywhere where the high water would be covering, that's still going to be considered a wetland even in the dry season because it's at least seasonally a wetland. Okay, so it supports hydrophytes. So you're going to see these definitions of wetlands are a little bit redundant because the first one is that it's wet and the second one is that it has plants that like to be wet. So let's look at some of these water adapted plants. Hydro meaning water, phyte meaning plant. Up in the top left, you can see cattails, um, genus Typha. So these you're gonna find in freshwater wetlands. They're a good indicator that the um, groundwater is freshwater. Just below that, we have hydrocotyl, and these you're gonna find again, standing water. Um, in freshwater wetlands. So often you see cattails and hydrocotyl together. Um, in 
are local wetlands, sometimes you will see cattails when there is some salt water present. So it is um, when you get fresh water and salt water mixing, it's called brackish water. And our local cattails are maybe a variety that can tolerate a little bit of that. So you'll sometimes see them in these sort of brackish, um, but you don't find them in pure saltwater wetlands. Unlike this one you see on the right, um, which is our uh, salicornia pickleweed. So these grow in our saltwater wetlands. So along the coast and in estuaries where you have um, an influx of saltwater coming in. Um, they don't like to be totally covered all the time. They need to be out of the water, um, but they can grow in areas where they get covered by water for at least part of the day. So this last one, the substrate is mostly hydric or undrained soil. So hydric soil basically just means water soil. Um, so when you're thinking about these three characteristics of wetlands, you're thinking, okay, there's water for at least part of the year. There's plants that love water and there's soils that show us that water has been here. So what do those soils look like? Up in the top left, you can see this really densely packed soil. Um, it looks dense like that because it's full of clay. Clay is the smallest soil particle. So you get a bunch of clay and it, you make these really massive soils that don't have a lot of pockets in between them, at least when they're saturated. And you can see the standing water um, just in the bottom part of that picture. And then if you look over on the right, you can see a similar soil type made of clay, but here we're in a dry season or a dry time where the water has been removed, which was such a large part of that clay soil that it has physically cracked apart because it's um, kind of all sticking to itself and there's no water to stick to. So you get these big cracks. And you've probably seen that around in um, areas that are super muddy and they dry out and they crack. So those are just high clay soils. So hydric soils, that's one part of um, how you kind of figure out whether a soil is hydric or not if there's no water present, is you look for high clay content. You can also look for the color. So top left, that clay um, is has been anaerobic for at least part of the year, so it gets this sort of blue-gray color to it, and um, that color is called glay. So glay soils um, have this uh, blue-gray appearance to them. Then in the bottom picture, you can see somebody dug into the soil and pulled out um, part of it. And you can see that there's this oranginess to it. And that oranginess is actual rust. So it's iron in the soil that has oxidized because it's been inundated with water. Um, and so that makes these rusty colors. So for hydric soils, you're looking for high clay content. You're looking for blue gray colors or orangey colors or just fully saturated with water. That doesn't work anymore. Okay, so the US, US Fish and Wildlife Service only requires one of these features to classify it as a wetland, which is pretty cool because if you have hydric soil, so you go and maybe the plants have been removed or you had some invasive plants come through and kind of replace your plant communities, um, you might not be able to tell by the plants that are there that that area was previously a wetland, but the soils might have that clay coloring or rust coloring or that cracking and high clay content to show you that that area once was a wetland and so you can protect it and restore it to be a wetland uh, which is pretty cool of our um, kind of changing views of um, what a wetland is and how we protect them.